I am Rabbi Joel Simon, the senior rabbi at Congregation Shari Tzedek, and it is truly my delight to welcome everyone here tonight for this very, very special, um, special program. Uh, while, while I'm the one up here as our current senior rabbi, it really should be Rabbi Richard Bernholtz who is welcoming everyone because Rabbi Bernholtz developed a friendship, a partnership with, with Dr. Tapey um, several years ago that created this um, avenue through which these amazing speakers could come and be, um, be at St. Leo and also uh, make the trek down to South Tampa to make things a little bit more accessible to folks down here. And now, through the wonders of the internet, um, this program is not only accessible to those who are able to join us, but to everyone who, who wants to be here through, uh, through Zoom as well. So I want to welcome everyone who's here in our sanctuary, and I want to welcome everyone who's joining us online. And when we're here for worship, when we're here for services, we always say that we feel that when you're joining us at home, it's as if your home becomes part of the sanctuary along with our sanctuary. So tonight, where we're part sanctuary, part classroom, um, you're, you're in the classroom with us and learning with us. And later on in the program, when we have an opportunity for question and answer, just as we'll be taking questions from the sanctuary, you'll be able to type questions in the chat box as well. So make sure you're paying attention and, uh, and are thinking of things that you might want to ask. So Rabbi Bernholtz, Dr. Tapey, thank you so much for, for creating this, um, this program. And, and just a quick word. Um, to Rabbi Novak that uh, when I was a student at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, this was one of the required books for my Christian studies class. And you helped me to gain a better understanding for why it's important for us as rabbis, us as a Jewish community, to have a partnership, to have dialogue with the Christian community. So to have you as a guest in our congregation participating in that dialogue is such an honor and I'm, I'm truly humbled to, uh, to have you here. And Dr. Lloyd, while I have not had the opportunity of reading your works or hearing you speak before, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your response and what you have to share. So Dr. Tapey, thank you to you. Thank you to St. Leo. And uh, I will turn things over to you at this time. Thank you, Rabbi Simon, for your warm welcome to everyone. And, and thank you to everyone here tonight uh, for coming out and joining us uh, in person. Tonight, uh, today, are our first uh, in-person programs since February of 2020. Some of you will recall that it was that month uh, that uh, Rabbi Jack Bemparad visited and gave a talk here at Shara Zedek. Uh, and so it's so nice to be here again with you. It makes so much sense to um, restart or continue our in-person programs uh, with you as our very kind host. Um, for those who may not know, especially friends tuning in on the live stream tonight uh, from places like Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, and even the UK, uh, St. Leo University is the oldest Catholic institution of higher education in Florida. Established in 1889 by the Order of St. Benedict of Florida. The main campus is located 30 minutes north of the Tampa Bay area, near the only hill in Florida. <laughs> and if you'd like to see it, give me a, uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to host you up there and we'll take a look at it together. The main campus is located 30 minutes north of the Tampa Bay area. Um, and I'm sorry, on the main campus, we educate uh, roughly 2,500 students each year. Uh, but at, at 16 satellite campuses in Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, Texas, South Carolina, and in online courses, we educate 18,000 students, making St. Leo University now the fourth largest Catholic university in the country, uh, highlighting its, uh, its impact on many, many students. The Center for Catholic Jewish Studies was established in 1998 through joint efforts of St. Leo and the American Jewish Committee and several principal founders, including Rabbi James Rudin, the senior interreligious advisor for the American Jewish Committee, and Dr. Arthur Kirk, 
the President Emeritus of St. Leo, uh, Bishop Robert Lynch of the Diocese of St. Petersburg, and Bishop Emeritus John Nevins of the Diocese of Venice. These leaders recognized the need among Florida's growing and diverse population for an academic center devoted to building mutual understanding among Catholics and Jews through interreligious study and dialogue, as emphasized by the Second Vatican Council. And so the mission of the CCGS is to build mutual respect and understanding and appreciation among Catholics and Jews and all people of goodwill by providing opportunities like this, where we come together and we speak to one another and we listen to a speaker. The CCGS remains the only academic center of its kind in the Southeast. Our mission, as I said, is to build mutual respect and understanding between people from different religious backgrounds, between the Catholic and the Jewish communities, between the two oldest institutions in the world, synagogue and church, as well as people of goodwill. How do we build understanding between people from different backgrounds? We build understanding across lines of difference through not only programs like this, but through the design of St. Leo courses like World Religions and Dialogue and the History and Theology of Catholic-Jewish Relations. We also build bridges through research and through publications. The bridges that I'm talking about right now, these bridges of understanding, are not made of steel or concrete. The bridges we try to build that we need your help to build are bridges that are made up of people coming together, speaking to one another. Pe bridges where two people come together from different backgrounds to understand each other better than they did before. The materials needed to build these bridges are, uh, are more difficult to acquire than concrete and steel. In fact, the materials needed to build bridges of understanding are made of things you can't buy. Things like mercy, humility, compassion, the ability to listen, the conviction that we must seek the truth together, that facts matter. These virtues are things that money can't buy. These virtues are in short supply. But just by attending a CCGS program like this one, you help us build these bridges. As Martin Luther King Jr. said in his letter from a Birmingham jail, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is an obstacle to justice. Rather, we must, he calls us to rise to what he, he says are the majestic heights of understanding. So present with us tonight are some members of the Center for Catholic Jewish, Nas Center for Catholic Jewish Studies National Advisory Board. And so I'd just like to briefly mention uh, them. Some of them are, are on Zoom. Some of them are here. Uh, Maureen and Doug Cohn, Mark Siegel, Gail and Paul Whiting, and Joyce Carpe. If you don't mind uh, just uh, welcoming them this evening. And again, I want to thank Charles Zedek, as well as uh, other co-sponsors like Tampa Jewish Federation and the Diocese of St. Petersburg. And Bishop Parks gives us his um, warm welcome tonight. He was unable to make it. I now want to introduce our esteemed guests. Dr. David Novak is the Richard and Dorothy Schiff Chair of Jewish Studies and Professor of the Study of Religion at the University of Toronto since 1997. From 1997 to 2002, he was also the director of the Jewish Studies Program. From 1989 to 97, he was the Edgar Bronfman Professor of Modern Judaic Studies at the University of Virginia. Previously, he taught at Oklahoma City University, Old Dominion University, New School for Social Research, the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, and Baruch College of the City University of New York. From 66 to 1989, he served as a pulpit rabbi in several communities in the United States. Novak is a founder, vice president, and coordinator of the Jewish Law Panel of the Union for Traditional Judaism, and a founder and faculty member of the Institute of Traditional Judaism in New Jersey. In 96, he delivered the Lancaster Yarnton Lectures at Oxford University and at Lancaster University. In 2004, he was the Charles E. Test, MD, Distinguished Visiting Professor at Princeton. In 2006, he was Visiting Professor of Religion at Princeton. He's lectured throughout North America, Europe, Israel, and South Africa. 
Novak is the author of 13 books. He is also the author of over 200 articles and scholarly intellectual journals. And tonight we also have the great fortune it is very fortunate for us to also be able to hear from Dr. Vincent Lloyd, who is the Associate Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at Villanova University, where he also directs the Africana Studies Program and the Center for Political Theology. Lloyd's books include Law and Transcendence, Black Natural Law, and the co-edited Anti-Blackness and Christian Ethics. He also has recently finished a book called Black Dignity, a Philosophy which is forthcoming from Yale University Press. Lloyd additionally edits the Reflection and Theory in the Study of Religion book series published by Oxford, and he co-edits a scholarly journal called Political Theology. Would you please join me in welcome, welcoming the, these esteemed scholars to Tampa Bay tonight? Thank you for the gracious introduction, and I will give more remarks of gratitude uh, later in this evening's program. There are two facts of my life which my grandchildren used to tell their friends with uh, pride. The first fact that is, in the, is that in the year 2000, as part of my application to become a Canadian citizen, I had to secure a letter from the Sheriff of Henrico County, Virginia, my last place of residence in the United States before moving to Canada, a letter ascertaining that I do not have a criminal record. My grandchildren could thus say with pride that their grandfather has never been a criminal and he can prove it. The second fact of my life, which they used to tell with far greater pride, is that in 1964, I shook the hand of Dr. Martin Luther King. The occasion was the June convocation of the Jewish Theological Seminary when Dr. King received an honorary doctorate and my class of rabbinical students received our Master of Hebrew Literature degree. Dr. King was so honored by our seminary due to his close friendship and collaboration with the great Jewish theologian, our late revered teacher, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Furthermore, the connection of some of us rabbinical students with Dr. King was much more than the coincidence of our receiving degrees at the same time in the same place. But for our teacher, Rabbi Heschel had enlisted some of us to work in the civil rights movement in which he and Dr. King were the generals and we were the mere foot soldiers. I say with pride, please don't consider it unbecoming boasting, how my colleagues and I marched in Washington, D.C., where we were cheered by some and had beer bottles thrown at us by others. And we Jewish seminarians marched together with Catholic seminarians. As Rabbi Heschel later said of his march in Selma, Alabama in 1965, we were, quote, praying with our feet. My reason for mentioning this first fact, namely about my not having a criminal record, is the, that Martin Luther King did have a criminal record. In August 1963, he was arrested in Birmingham, Alabama, for participating in, actually leading, a nonviolent demonstration against racial segregation, which according to the local law was illegal. During his incarceration, Dr. King wrote what is now a classic of political theology, his letter from Birmingham jail. It is my text for this evening's lecture because it is a most powerful statement of universal morality or what is called natural law. And it is a text that I feel a particular personal connection to due to my small connection to Martin Luther King through Abraham Joshua Heschel, both of whom taught me and many other Christians and Jews the real meaning of natural law in practice and not only in theory. 
They taught Jews and Christians to practice what we preach, to show how effective Martin Luther King's activities have been. In 2002, I heard with my own ears how the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court say in the federal courthouse in Montgomery, how Martin Luther King had taught him and his fellow white citizens that racial segregation is sinful. Indeed, the letter from Birmingham jail hangs on the wall of that courthouse lobby. Now in his own eyes and in the eyes of the faithful Christians and Jews who were with him in both spirit and body, Dr. King was not a criminal. Therefore, his incarceration in Birmingham jail was unjust. No, the criminals there were the political officials of Birmingham because of their violation of what Dr. King called, quote, our God-given and constitutional rights. It is these God-given human rights that justly made human constitutions codify and endorse. As he put it, quote, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. On the other hand, an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with moral law. An unjust law is a law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law, close quote. Thus he urged us to, quote, disobey segregation ordinances because they are morally wrong. In pondering these profound statements, so as to better understand their wisdom, four questions come to mind. One, why does there have to be a higher moral law by which we decide which human-made law is to be obeyed and which human-made law is to be disobeyed? Two, why call this higher moral law the law of God? Three. Why call this higher moral law natural law? Four, how do we humans know this higher moral law and why are we obligated by it? These are four questions that come to my mind in reading and rereading and studying the letter from Birmingham Jail. As for the first question of why does there have to be a higher moral law, there are many people who consider themselves secular rather than religious and who consider themselves to be moral and who oppose any kind of discrimination who would say with uh, Thomas Jefferson that immoral just practices are self-evidently wrong because they are irrational. Why appeal to vague metaphysical realities like a higher law when all one needs is the practical rationality or common sense of something like don't treat others as you wouldn't want to be treated by others. Now this, of, of course, assumes that humans are naturally inclined to be decent, rational, and empathetic. Thus, indecent, irrational, non-empathetic individuals are unnatural, abnormal exceptions to human nature. These isolated individuals are taken to be sociopaths. They are only in need of education or psychotherapy to rehabilitate them, turning them back into normal members of the human community. However, reminded by his fellow Protestant theologian, the great Reinhold Niebuhr, Dr. King asserted, quote, that groups are more immoral than individuals. As such, the crime or sin of discriminatory desegregation was not the abnormal activity of lone criminals, but rather the work of normal individual persons doing the bidding of their own society. In other words, instead of checking their activity, their society enabled them to do more evil than they would have possibly been able to do alone. In the eyes of their society, not only were the enforcers of segregation innocent of any wrongdoing, they were praised for being the righteous upholders of the common good. So if this common good is what this community considers the good that is to be done by its citizens in common, any appeal to the common traditional morality of that society 
especially by Christians and Jews who demonstrated with Dr. King any such appeal would be counterproductive. In fact, the segregationists protested that these discriminatory policies are, quote, our traditional way of life, which they took to be their moral duty to uphold. So when such condemnation is made by those outside this particular tradition, like those in the 1950s who used to be called out-of-state agitators, the local discriminators would often retort, who are you to impose your morality on us? I might add that those today who consider all standards, whether scientific or moral, to be socially constructed, they also have no answer to this kind of relativistic retort. That is why the only way of judging socially endorsed and encouraged activities like racial discrimination to be evil is by an appeal to a higher moral law by which all individual persons in all societies are judged. And those doing the judging affirm that they are to be judged for their violations of this higher or transcendent law as much as those whom they accuse of violating it. One might say that the accusers as much as the accused are accusable. Dr. King meant just that kind of consistency when he insisted that the demonstrators themselves, quote, go through a process of self-purification. Those are his words. And that reminds me of the Talmud's admonition, correct yourself first, then go correct others. And that leads into the second question, namely, why call this higher moral law the law of God? Why not simply appeal to the ideal of pure, a full political and economic reality, uh, equality? Now, surely Dr. King was right to insist that the function of such a higher transcendent law is to provide a justification for human-made law that, in his words, squares with it, and provide a condemnation of humanly made law that is out of harmony with it. But ideals are themselves devised by human ideologues. They are projections of what some humans want to become a reality in the world. Idealists are those who work to realize the ideals that began as ideas thought up by ideologues. However, like human-made laws, ideals can just as easily be made unmade by their makers as they were made by them. But how is an ideal able to be the superior justification or condemnation of human-made laws when, in fact, it is essentially no different from them? Furthermore, since an ideal admits of no argument for its validity, how is the egalitarian ideal of full political and economic equality any more justifiable than the segregationist ideal of a racially pure society or world? How is the common ideal anything more than a prejudice one group of people wants to project onto the world? As the great Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain proclaimed during his exile from his native France during World War II, then France then under Nazi tyranny, societies that have no other purpose than the perpetuation of their own racial identity as an end in itself need a negative other to define themselves against. Acknowledging no one above or over them, they have nothing to survive for. In the eyes of the Nazis, those negative others are the Jews. In the eyes of American racists, those negative others are the blacks. This similarity in ideology explains why this kind of racism, this kind of racism, not Christian anti-Judaism, was the predominant influence on Hitler and his followers. The racist ideology that motivated Dr. King's persecutors could have been written by Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's chief ideologue. In the letter, Dr. King is quite aware of the similarity between these two kinds of racism. That is why God-made law is the only adequate criterion by which a humanly made law is judged to be either just or unjust, either right or wrong. Also, ideals do not command us to act. Only laws do that. 
Yet a law doesn't make itself. So to speak of a higher law, one must speak of a higher lawgiver and a higher judge of whether that law has been kept or transgressed. And the lawgiver, that judge of all the earth, Shofet Kol Haaretz, which we read about in Genesis 18.25, could only be the creator of heaven and earth. Anyone else posing as such is an imposter. Yet you might ask if humanly made laws and ideals are just as easily unmade by humans as much as they've been made by them, isn't God-made law just as easily unmade by God as it is made by God? To answer this powerful question, we have to remember that Dr. King was explicitly addressing, quote, my Christian and Jewish brothers. Now, the Christians and Jews most likely to resonate to his address are biblically literate enough and biblically committed enough to know and accept God's covenantal promise not to change, not to ever undo his law. For the law of God, God's Torah, is Devar Eloheinu Yakum Olam, the word of our God will stand forever, Isaiah 48. This covenantal promise can be believed by Jews and Christians because we are already living under the law of God and regularly experiencing its unchanging, permanent character. In fact, faithful Jews and faithful Christians resist the efforts of those in their own respective communities who would change the unchangeable law of God. To be sure, there are significant differences between Jews and Christians as to what exactly constitutes the unchangeable law of God. These differences, though, are almost always in the area of the God-human relationship, especially as it is enacted in worship. Jewish and Christian liturgical practices are significantly different. However, in the area of interpersonal relationships, what could be called the moral realm, the differences are quite minor. The moral teaching of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament is foundational for both Judaism and Christianity. Furthermore, when Martin Luther King castigated quote, the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South for committing themselves to a completely otherworldly religion which made a strange distinction between bodies and souls, the sacred and the secular. In those words, he was reiterating the ancient Jewish teaching that there is no aspect of the God-human relationship that doesn't impinge on the relationship between humans. In other words, the church or the synagogue is not to be a place where a Christian or a Jew hides from human community to be cozy with God. Rather, they are to be the places from which God sends us into the human community to sanctify it by our practice of justice. When Dr. King spoke of, quote, men willing to be co-workers with God, he may well have been consciously paraphrasing the Talmud. Quote, every judge who judges honestly, as it were, becomes God's partner in the work of creation. I can even imagine my late revered teacher, Abraham Joshua Heschel, teaching that truth to Martin Luther King. Jews like Rabbi Heschel are, in the words of the late Paul, John, Pope John Paul II, Christians elder brothers. All this notwithstanding, this higher moral, moral law of God is not something that only pertains to Jews and Christians. And now we must say it not only pertains to Muslims too. It also applies to all humankind universally. That is why Dr. King, explicitly influenced by St. Thomas Aquinas, calls this law natural. Identifying with this tradition of natural law theory and practice, Dr. King invokes Thomas Jefferson's famous words, quote, that all men are created equal. Now, who created all humans equal? For Jefferson, who is neither a Christian nor a Jew, this creator is what he called nature's God. 
Thus, nature means the whole world that God has created intelligently or with wisdom. But without nature being taken as God's intelligible creation, what reason is there for even affirming that human rights and human duties are equally shared by all those who comprise humankind? What the Talmud calls the dignity due humans, kavod habriot, only makes sense when every human being is considered to be a creature, nivra in Hebrew, ens creatum in Latin, equally created in the image and likeness of God. In any other view of the human condition, the inequality of human beings seems to be much more self-evident. Even though natural law is universally applicable law, no human being is exempt from practicing it or exempt from being dignified by it. It is still something that only Jews and Christians can actually know, actually teach, actually enforce, and actually judge by. Is that really true? In other words, how do Jews, Christians, and now Muslims answer the charge of secularists that we are religious imperialists imposing our morality on those who don't accept the premises from which our morality is derived. How often have we heard the cry, who are you to ram your religion down our throats? The answer to this charge is that natural law has not been invented by Judaism or Christianity or Islam. Instead, it is evident to all rational purpose persons that our lives, our bodies, our possessions are to be respected insofar as we humans cannot expect such respect for ourselves if we are not willing to extend it to others. Also, we deserve this respect even if we cannot extend it to others, and we'd extend it to others whether they deserve it or not. This basic recognition of essential human dignity is minimally rational insofar as arguing against it would lead one into the absurd demand to be treated respectfully oneself when one has no intention of respecting the others to whom this demand is made. You don't have to be religious in any way to appreciate this moral rationality. However, if that is all you need to be moral, who needs Judaism, Christianity, or Islam with all their excessive theological baggage? In fact, wasn't Martin Luther King's presence in his church on Sunday at best superfluous to his moral calling during the rest of the week, or at worst, a deviation from it? Two answers to this charge come to mind. One, Dr. King's Christian faith and Rabbi Heschel's Jewish faith, while not providing the content of natural law nor the knowledge of natural law, Nevertheless, they do very much deepen our appreciation of the subjects of natural law who are humans created in the image of God. Thus, human dignity, which natural law activates, puts into action, is now more than something humans agree to by a process of liber uh, elimination. That is because the alternatives have, have proven to be horrible. Human dignity can now be consistently taught as a positive universal truth. Even though we don't derive natural laws from this theological premise, this theological premise informs natural law by putting it into a cosmic context. God has built human dignity into the created natural order. And the second answer to the secularist charge of who needs religion for morality is that nobody lives according to natural law directly. Whatever law or moral norms we live by come from our particular communal traditions. They come from and are developed in the historical locations where we live in this world. Within these communal traditions is where and when we see how natural law provides a wise criterion for confirming the justice of old laws, for guiding the making of new laws, for rejecting new laws that are unjust, and for radically reinterpreting old laws that now seem unjust. Do remember that in principle, Dr. King was speaking to all those who were either segregators or victims of segregation, whether religious, irreligious, or even anti-religious. In fact, though, 
He was speaking to his fellow Christians and Jews to clean up your act. He did this by invoking principles of natural law or natural justice, what in German is called Naturrecht, that our religious traditions have built upon, which always accompany their development, and which can never be superseded. This is what has given our religious traditions universal moral credence, though they are still essentially concerned with much more than inner human morality. Much more, but never even a little bit less. Studying the letter from Birmingham jail and continuing to learn from it and be inspired by it is still very much needed in our time when there is as much and even more injustice than in 1963 when it was written. It was this injustice that Martin Luther King battled throughout his too short life and for which he paid for with his martyrdom. As we Jews say, Yehei Zichro Baruch, may his memory continue to be a blessing and may the Torah he taught us in word and in deed continue to enlighten our darkness. As his teacher and mine, Abraham Joshua Heschel, taught us, we are to conquer evils one by one until the one comes and conquers all evil. Thank you for your kind attention. Very intimidating to come uh, up here after uh, Rabbi N Novak. Thank you so much for welcoming me into your, your space and your homes via the video feed. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tapey, for uh, inviting me here to Tampa uh, to join in the celebration of Rabbi Novak. I wasn't quite sure why I was uh, invited at first when Dr. Uh, Tapey reached out. Uh, I study African-American uh, political movements and the role of religion in them, thinking about not only uh, Dr. King and his predecessors, but also contemporary movements like Black Lives Matter and the role that religious and spiritual traditions play in those movements. So I, I thought it, first of all, I, I probably don't have too much uh, to, to say about Jewish-Christian dialogue. And I remembered back, and uh, my dissertation advisor when I was in graduate school was a, a Jewish gentleman who uh, was also a scholar of uh, uh, Talmud, among other things. And so I guess I, I had had some Jewish-Christian uh, Jewish dialogue back in my past there. And then I started to remember some more, and my, my dissertation was on a, um, a Jewish philosopher who almost converted, but didn't quite convert to uh, Christianity, and thinking about uh, the role of that person in uh, philosophical theology in the 20th century, so I guess there was some Jewish-Christian uh, dialogue that I just hadn't been thinking about uh, in my past there. And then I, I thought some more, and I realized, I guess, more immediately, my wife is Israeli, and so uh, every day we have some uh, Jewish-Christian dialogue uh, that happens uh, in, in the house. And my daughter is Jewish, so uh, she has a bit of a vexed relationship to her uh, Judaism, but I guess that makes her uh, all the more Jewish. We, we have some Jewish-Christian dialogue there. My father-in-law is a rabbi in Brooklyn, and uh, is a very impressive uh, uh, photographic memory, 5,000 pages of Talmud somewhere in his head. Uh, I guess there's some uh, Jewish-Christian dialogue. So then I, I thought to think, maybe, maybe I do too much Jewish-Christian dialogue. Maybe I don't want to come down here and have uh, yet, yet more of this uh, kind of thing. But uh, uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, appreciative of the, the opportunity to uh, honor Doc, uh, Rabbi uh, Novak at this, uh, this occasion for his life's work. And in all seriousness, uh, as I reflected on, on my own uh, early uh, scholarly writing, uh, which was animated uh, by the problem of supersessionism, a theological problem that I argued migrated into cultural spaces and philosophical spaces, um, I wanted to grapple with how does this uh, Christian idea that uh, there's a new law that replaces an old law, right? a, a law of uh, love and grace that replaces an old law of rule following. H how does that shape the, the cultural imagination? How does that shape a contemporary uh, philosophy uh, uh, outside of specifically religious spaces? And uh, I worked on that for a while, and then I moved on to thinking about questions of race. And then I realized as I was uh, preparing for this evening's remarks that uh, when I moved on to new things, I was still grappling with that question. The new things I moved on to 
uh, were investigating natural law in the African-American tradition, looking at natural law in Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass, Anna Julia Cooper, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, and the whole tradition of African-American thinkers who were appealing to a higher law or God's law. They weren't doing that in a way that was replacing uh, uh, law with grace. Uh, they, weren't, uh, they were grappling with the complexities of, of law, the way that human law uh, partially participates in uh, but uh, always needs to be corrected by divine law. They were grappling with the way that humans have access through reflection on our own nature to uh, some uh, element of divine law or uh, justice. So in a sense, right, the, the African-American tradition in my own trajectory, I realized uh, I turned to as a, if not resolution, at least response to this uh, uh, problem of supersessionism that animates uh, many uh, Jewish Christian uh, conversations. What I thought I would uh, do in my very brief uh, response uh, this evening was first to offer an appreciation of uh, Rabbi Novak's uh, paper um, and his contribution to scholarship, and then uh, second uh, to ask a couple of questions to uh, get the, the conversation going. So first, uh, uh, by way of appreciation, among the, the many, many books on the list that I had to read uh, when I was a graduate student appeared at Rabbi Novak's uh, publications. Uh, in reading those books uh, and in hearing Rabbi Novak, I've been uh, struck by the sense that humanity, human life matters, value, deserves value, and that's something that's felt deeply uh, in Rabbi Novak uh, and it manifests in his scholarly uh, production. There's a human concern for the human, for the humane, for humanity, that, all, that life itself matters, life itself is sacred, that motivates even the more abstract and philosophical reflection that we find uh, in his work. We also find in that work, abstract and philosophical reflection, a rigor of thought that models what it means to take ideas seriously, to grapple with the world of uh, the mind. Uh, and uh, while this may seem just like academic work uh, for some, right, uh, just like what one does in an ivory tower, th this practice of sharpening concepts, of reflecting on texts and figuring out what they're really saying, what their argument is and what it isn't, what the appropriate language is to describe them, this uh, philosophical work this rigorous thought is what opens new horizons of possibility for reflecting on justice, for reflecting on the sacredness of, of life, right? going beyond conventional wisdom about what our humanity is and how it matters to asking new questions about what we may have missed before. Third, uh, for Rabbi Novak, religious ideas matter. It's not just philosophical ideas, it's not just a, a game of concepts, right? But they're religious ideas that develop in traditions that are felt, that are practiced by communities. The tradition that is alive, this is where we must turn to find the richest resources for addressing this fundamental problem of our humanity and the humanity of others for the sacredness of life. In Rabbi Novak's uh, remarks and in his broader work, there's a, a deep concern that if we ignore the resources of religious traditions, something will be lost. So humanity will be lost, and it's only by that deep engagement, not just in a, a gesture toward Aquinas in the, in the Catholic case or Maimonides or so on, uh, but in grappling with the complexity of ideas, the churn of religious thought and practice and its embeddedment in, uh, embedding in community over time that we can do th this kind of um, work that is so needed 
uh, in, a, in places and times when humanity is disrespected. And, and my fourth point of uh, appreciation here is uh, with respect to Rabbi Novak's willingness to engage beyond the tradition uh, from which he comes a, as a, a model for, of uh, interreligious uh, dialogue in his own scholarship as a participant in, in dialogues, as um, one who, uh, as we heard already uh, this evening, is thinking carefully with uh, a Christian theologian, Martin Luther King, uh, a holder of a PhD in theology from Boston University. Uh, this uh, goes beyond simply the rigor of philosophical thought, goes beyond uh, diving into the uh, complexity of one religious tradition, but brings alive that philosophical work, those, that religious tradition, by locating it in a complicated world, a world inhabited by plural religious communities, and that engagement is, again, fundamentally motivated by this sense that our shared humanity matters. It is sacred. Indeed, these virtues of Rabbi Novak's work, rigor of thought, the engagement with religious ideas and their complexity and his willingness to engage across traditions has been a helpful model for me in my, my own scholarship as I have been writing about natural law and dignity and African American traditions. I didn't want to uh, just deal with the conceptual, just make an argument about what human nature is for black thinkers, or just make an argument about the, the pathway from uh, reflection uh, on human nature to uh, valuing of dignity. I, I wanted to um, uh, do that rigorous philosophical work engaged with religious traditions, uh, both uh, Christian traditions, uh, the vernacular Christian traditions of, of black culture and beyond, thinking about the way that black thinkers, and of course in Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, we see this very explicitly referencing Aquinas and Buber and Tillich and secular thinkers uh, and, uh, and um, uh, others, this willingness uh, to uh, engage beyond a tradition was essential for me for understanding what that uh, natural law tradition within African American religion and politics is like. So two questions uh, to uh, begin our, our conversation uh, this evening. The first question grows out of a distinction that Rabbi Novak, I think, really helpfully made in uh, the, the remarks that we just heard between the process of discerning natural law, how you figure it out, and the content of natural law what it says you should do. Right? So keeping these two things uh, uh, separate, thinking about them in turn, right, seems like a really helpful move uh, for me and, and one that I, I uh, make use of in, in my own uh, scholarship. And when we think uh, about that first step, the process of discernment of natural law, we're faced with a variety of options. right? The, the traditional option that uh, Catholic theologians have also often taken, especially in the 20th century, is to focus on reason. The part of human nature uh, on which we can reflect in order to learn things about uh, natural law right, is our capacity to reason. But human nature is much more expansive than that, and I think Martin Luther King is especially good at um, uh, naming that expansiveness of human nature. It's not just about our capacity to reason. It's also about our capacity to feel, to have emotions and affects, to imagine, perhaps to pray and prophecy. So I, I'm curious, when we're thinking about this process of discernment of, of natural law, how do we expand beyond the, the, the focus on reason as the, the core marker of, of human nature. Second, uh, from the, Martin Luther King's words, and of course King speaks about natural law, not only in letter from Birmingham jail, but throughout his career from the time uh, that he was preaching in, in black pulpits, even before he went to theological, theological school, before he was exposed to the, the water, wider European and uh, white academy, Right? drawing on vernacular black Christian traditions. 
For King, discerning natural law was a collective effort. It wasn't something that one does sitting alone in an office. It wasn't something that one does in an ivory tower or in a library figuring out you know, how do we go from here, the kind of reasoning that I'm doing about myself, to some conclusions about how I ought to live or how I ought to tell others to live. It's something that happens collectively. It's something that it happens in motion, in a group. Right? Uh, it's a, a process of discernment that is always bouncing off the ideas of others. Even King, when he's preaching, is bouncing off the, uh, the, the ideas and emotions and feelings of others as the congregation community is responding to the words that he's saying, that uh, very first meeting of the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, when he names natural law as a justification for the, the boycott that would launch the civil rights movement. You know, he's getting feedback from the audience, and it's a, it's a collective process. And I, I'm curious about uh, how that individual versus collective nature of, of natural law discernment would, would play out in the framework Rabbi Novak gave to us. In a sense, uh, for King, it seems, natural law is more poetry than uh, prose, something that is uh, felt and somewhat elusive, uh, making allusions, uh, connecting things, rather than offering a, a system performed in rhetoric or animated by uh, rhetoric, but also leading to collective action. And here I want to turn briefly from the process of discerning natural law to the content of natural law. And the content is where things get messy, right? Where, thing, where people start arguing, right? Where, where uh, the, the, the thing that made Joe Biden so worried about natural law when on the first day of Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearings to the US Supreme Court, Joe Biden said, this committee's primary job is to investigate what Clarence Thomas really thinks about natural law because Biden was worried about that content of natural law, about the conclusions that Thomas reached by natural law and seemingly justified by their alignment with the divine, right, with uh, God's law. So I, I wonder in Martin Luther King's case, yes, segregation is, is wrong, right? That, that's one uh, sort of normative conclusion, one conclusion we get from uh, King's natural law theory. But it, it often seems like the focus is on the process, on the discernment, on the appeal to something higher, something beyond, to the injustice of these laws, rather than to a new law that would be just, right? If there's a new law, it's described gesturally rather than systematically. But what you do get, right, the kind of content that you do get is action, right? From that first meeting of the Montgomery uh, bus, uh, Montgomery Improvement Association, the, the group leading the bus boycott, King invokes natural law, and then they do something, right? Then they organize, they form committees. They figure out how they're going to uh, make this boycott happen. They uh, figure out where their next meeting is going to be, who's going to bring the, the whiteboard and the markers, right? All of those steps of organizing uh, are precipitated by th that natural law reflection. So I, I'm curious whether we might think about that content of natural law more as uh, uh, action or performance rather than as, as content or precepts, things that, that might be divisive or people arguing about. Maybe there's time for divisiveness, but maybe that, that kind of action is uh, also helpful to think about. Second uh, uh, question, um, which, which is the question that always comes up, uh, so I'll rehearse it um, in these sorts of conversations. Just how Christian is this natural law thing? Right? Martin Luther King is clearly a Christian uh, theologian. Right? He is uh, uh, trained uh, with a, a, a PhD in theology. He's a pastor. He's a preacher. And he believes in Jesus. Right? Uh, and he believes in hope. Right? He believes in a triptych of the theological virtues, faith, love, and hope, fitting together. And it's for King, that memory of Jesus on earth that can animate the action, the organizing, the practice that follows from that natural law discernment uh, in the world and that makes the hope turn into action that's cultivated in the, in the communities that he's part of. Uh, uh, the caricature of uh, Jewish tradition, and I, I'm happy to be uh, corrected on this, is that uh, the focus is on faith, not so much on hope, and love is a little iffy. 
Uh, at least that's what uh, my, my wife tells me sometimes. Um, uh, and I, I wonder if um, that, uh, that formation of theological virtues uh, is distinctive, uh, how that, that, that triptych of theological virtues is necessary or not necessary for the kind of natural law uh, uh, position that Rabbi Novak is, is uh, advocating. I don't want to go on more and more, but I just want to end with a final word of appreciation. I have learned so much over many years from your work, and it's such an honor to be sharing a stage with you. Thank you so much, Rabbi Nova. My, my, my work and, and my activities in, in, in the world. Um, First of all, I want to say that Dr. Lloyd began uh, by saying uh, he wasn't sure why he was invited to be the commentator on my paper. Well, you were in invited to be the commentator on my paper before I even wrote it. <laughs> because Dr. Tapey wanted me to discuss natural law as a, a is a common bridge between Judaism and Christianity. Now, I've written on, on that a lot in a very more or less theoretical mode. And uh, okay, you know, I could cart out some of the things that I've written and, and, and you know, and, and recycle them uh, and, and, and whatever. But then when he told me that you were gonna be the commentator and what your background is, said to me, I, I really have to respond to a respondent from where he's at. And if you're interested in natural law as it grew up in, uh, in the black community and the concern with it and in, in, in the traditions of the, uh, of the black community, uh, then it came to mind that not only are my grandchildren proud of the fact that I shook Martin Luther King's hand, but I remember reading the letter from Birmingham jail uh, reading it many years ago, and then reading it in 2002 where it's hanging in the courthouse in Montgomery, Alabama, the very state where Martin Luther King was incarcerated in, in not far from Birmingham uh, in 1963. So therefore, when it came to your being the respondent, you were announced as the respondent before I really knew what I wanted to say, and because you were the respondent, therefore I thought it would be appropriate for me to uh, access uh, uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, I, I think that the, the, the main point of some of the questions you raise is the uh, relationship, the, the relation, the dialectic relation between theory and practice. Between theory and practice. And uh, this came to me very, very early in uh, uh, my career of the interaction of theory and practice. Uh, my first rabbinical job was as the Jewish chaplain in St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., the Federal Mental Hospital. And at the same time, I was doing my doctoral work at uh, Georgetown University, working under the distinguished Catholic philosopher, uh, Germain Grise, of blessed memory. Uh, and my dissertation topic at Georgetown, and it was, uh, it was because of my work in the hospital, was the question of suicide in three philosophers, Plato, Aquinas, and Kant. And the way, this was before there was a, a field called bioethics, and my uh, dealing with it was the question, is that my experience in the hospital was that there were therapists who were dealing with suicidal people who had tremendous clinical skills, tremendous practical skills, but if you asked them why they were doing what they were doing, how it had been thought out, that was something that they couldn't give you an answer to. And then I had colleagues in, uh, fellow students and faculty in Georgetown University who were teaching ethics, uh, who had great theories, had great theories, but 
didn't have a clue, but had lived in this academic bubble of real life, and you see real life in a mental hospital with all of its agony, with all of its inconsistencies, with all of its pain and sorrow and injustice. And so therefore that was the uh, attempt. And it was said about one of my teachers at Georgetown University, another prominent Catholic philosopher, that was told to me many years later by a priest friend of mine, he said, it's, obviously that, it's obvious that this man never sat in the confessional. He never had to deal with the real problems that a priest in the confessional has to deal with. So therefore, in that work, uh, I was uh, attempting to bring a theoretical perspective to the practitioners and to bring the experience of the practitioners to the attention of the, of, of the theorists. Uh, and that is what I, I, I do in, in, in my rabbinical work. I'm, I'm still a rabbi. Uh, I functioned as, as, as a rabbi, in, as chaplain and rabbi of congregations. There's a, 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 actually somebody in the audience who was a member of a con my last congregation in Far Rockaway, New York. Uh, and uh, that's what I, 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 I brought to it, this, this kind of perspective. And the perspective is that on the one hand, uh, even when I was a rabbi, I was always teaching philosophy and theology. That was the theoretical side. But also, and even to this day, as, 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 as a rabbi, I am chairman of a committee that deals with very practical questions of Jewish law as they pertain to real life situations. So in, in that way, I have tried to, uh, to uh, combine and interact the theoretical with the, uh, uh, with, with the practical. And this is illustrated uh, in the Talmud. Uh, when a practical question is raised, you know, Rabbi so-and-so says do this, and Rabbi so -and -so, somebody else says do that. The Talmud's question is the Micah Mepalke. What is their difference in principle? Why do they differ practically? There must be a theoretical background to it. They're not just blindly saying, I, this is what I think, and that is what I think. On the other hand, when there is a theoretical difference, the question will be, my be naihu. What practical difference does it make? So people that are only at the practical side, uh, frequently their practice is inconsistent, uh, unintelligent or lacking in some intelligence. They mean well, uh, but they really don't understand what they're doing. And then we have people on the theoretical side who have great theories uh, who don't have a clue to what human life is in uh, extremis. I remember hearing once uh, a great rabbinical philosopher uh, his name is, uh, died a number of years ago, but his name is still quoted in all sorts of circles. Uh, and uh, my son-in-law, who is a neurosurgeon, uh, once went to a lecture uh, by this rabbi. My son-in-law is, is, is also very Talmudically learned. And he said, this, this lecture, which was on you know, bioethics, he said, we couldn't possibly function in a hospital if we took this perspective, because this man had no conception of what it's like on the ground. On the other hand, there's a certain practical wisdom that uh, is there that the theoret theoreticians cannot come in and, and simply dictate to the practitioners. The practitioners can, should employ the theory to better understand what they're doing, but the practice is not deduced from uh, the theory. So that is, uh, how uh, uh, it works, and people that generally will present some grand theory uh, without the practical on the ground experience, or at least consulting the on the ground experience, uh, it's very, very beautiful, uh, but it be seems to be talking about an ideal world rather than this very real world which we uh, uh, live in. Uh, 
And in, in, in terms of, at, at times of being a, a dyan, a, a, a rabbinical judge, uh, I might have a certain theory, a certain theological theory about some very important concept in, in the Torah and developed in the, in the Talmud, and that somebody's before me with a, a, a real life problem. And what's more important? I can deduce from my theory what they should do, but it's not gonna be very good for them. So therefore, we employed a method that's called casistry. You look at the case itself, and then you pull a little bit from here and a little bit from there to explain what you're doing. But you don't deduce from your theory what the practice is doing. Your theory should inform uh, the practice. So th these are some of the things that uh, are very much uh, uh, the case here. Uh, and it's something that it needs to be uh, understood. But as I say, I always remember my, my priest friend saying about the philosopher, it's obvious he never sat in the confessional. Well, to a certain extent, I've sat in the Jewish equivalent of the confessional. Uh, we're now turned to our portion of our program, uh, the Eternal Light Award portion of the program. Uh, since 1998, the Eternal Light Award has been given to scholars who have made outstanding contributions to Catholic Jewish studies. Each year, the Scholarly Advisory Board of the CCJS nominates and then selects the recipient. You can find a list of previous recipients in the program. This year's recipient is Rabbi Dr. David Novak. Novak has made Jewish-Christian dialogue part of the core of his work. He has done this for decades without ceasing to teach and write with Jews as his primary audience. He has helped Jews learn from and develop friendships with Christians, and he has helped Christians do the same with the Jewish tradition. David's work reflects an incredible depth and breadth, for some religion should stay in one corner of life, and the life of the intellect and the wisdom of the world are on the other side. But for David, the wisdom of the world should be brought into conversation with Torah. As a student of Heschel, his work reflects the belief that Jewish theology is not an island, that it must be engaged in conversation with the philosophers and the theologians of other traditions. Indeed, Jewish theology can even challenge the basic categories of the conversation. In 1989, David published one of his most well-known works entitled Jewish-Christian Dialogue, A Jewish Justification, uh, which uh, Rabbi Joel uh, mentioned at the very beginning of the program, which he has and, and Dr. Novak signed. And Dr. Novak signed my copy of this book earlier today. It's in my office. Um, a theme can be detected uh, in Novak's work uh, and it's important, it's that both Christians and Jews are on a journey to the God of Abraham that is beyond our expectations. He teaches that it is God's voice that calls us both into this future. A personal story from his book illustrates David's attitude to engaging in interreligious dialogue quite nicely. As a young boy in the 1940s, he had a conversation with a man on a train who turned out to be a retired Methodist minister. Young David told the man that his favorite book was the Bible, and his favorite person in the Bible was Abraham, the first Jew. The Methodist minister responded positively. David re reports in the book, he says, he felt that he discovered in that conversation a shared unity with the Methodist minister, a shared yearning for the God of Abraham. David writes, quote, we began talking about Abraham, and I sensed that he too was Abraham's son, that we both saw ourselves coming from Father Abraham. I discovered that our trip was not at all like that of our fellow passengers on the train. Our trip, like Father Abraham's trip, was to that unknown destination. Then and there on that train, we were equals. Each of us accepted the other exactly as he was. David goes on and he says, if Jews and Christians are anything, they are people who have heard the God of Abraham's voice and sought to obey it in faithfulness. Because they are these people who have heard God's voice, they may not easily be able to converse with secular neighbors who think the idea of God's voice is an illusion. But surely, David says, Jews and Christians should be able to converse with each other it is precisely because Jews and Christians have faith that the Lord hears and speaks 
that they can speak and hear the words of one another. Over the course of his career, David has done just that. He has engaged in a profound and extended conversation with Christians and Christian thought. He has taught in the company of eminent Christian scholars. He has trained hundreds of students, some of whom are now leading Jewish theologians and philosophers. I asked a few scholars to share with us tonight some comments about David's contributions. Dr. Adam Gregerman, the associate professor uh, in the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at St. Joseph's University, said David's contribution to Jewish Christian relations is impressively broad and deep. His humorous, I'm sorry, his numerous and popular writings, and he is, he is very humorous though. His numerous and popular writings have brought his ideas to a wide audience. His scholarly work is consistently insightful and creative. He writes as one both well-grounded in Jewish tradition and responsive to our unprecedented contemporary circumstances. Few scholars have been more influential or more thoughtful about Jewish Christian relations. Dr. Matthew Levering, a very influential Catholic theologian, uh, had this to say about David. In the domain of Jewish Christian dialogue, David Novak's contributions are equaled only by those of his mentor, Abraham Joshua Heschel and Franz Rosenzweig. But Heschel and Rosenzweig lived prior to the full blossoming of Jewish Christian dialogue at an advanced level as we see it now. And so almost single-handedly, David Novak has sustained serious dialogue between devout Jews and devout Christians without grounding the dialogue upon watering down the faith of either side. Finally, David Novak, in the words of Randy Rashkover and Martin Kavka, two scholars uh, who are actually students of David, say, David is one of the world's leading contemporary Jewish thinkers. One of the marks of a great thinker is the ability to respond to the conditions and problems of one's time by changing the terms of the conversation. By this standard, David Novak ranks as one of the great American theologians of our time. End quote. Few Jewish theologians can be said to have attended with greater rigor and attention to Jewish Christian dialogue than Dr. Novak. And tonight we have a very special opportunity to honor his truly unique contributions by presenting him with the 17th Eternal Light Award, which reads as follows. The, the Eternal Light Award presented to Rabbi Dr. David Novak uh, for your lifelong commitment to the study of Jewish theology, philosophy, training future scholars, and promoting mutual understanding and respect between Christians and Jews throughout the world. Would you please join me in welcome and uh, 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 congratulating Dr. Novak. Thank you very much. I don't know how I'm going to go to sleep tonight. Uh, my, my, my head is swirling. Oh, speak for the center pony. I'm okay. okay. Well, let's leave this here for the time being. I don't want to break it. Uh, I'm a rabbi, so let me close with a, a, a Devar Torah, a word of Torah, that, which expresses my appreciation for my receiving this uh, award, my, my deep appreciation. It's called the eternal light. The eternal light actually means the perpetual light of the menorah, which was in the temple, which was lighted at the beginning of the evening and then burned in, until the, uh, into the morning. It's a near tamid, it means a perpetual light, even though we use the term uh, eternal. No, nothing created is really uh, eternal, but I understand the use of the term. It says also about the temple, and I remember learning this as uh, a boy from a teacher of, uh, of the Tanakh of the Bible, uh, Mr. Moshe Silverman, may he, Allah uh, Basholam, may he, Zichor Levracha, may rest in peace. And, it says a, a very enigmatic statement. It says that the windows of the sanctuary were shkufim vatumim, which means they were like a cone, 
which is wide, uh, you know, at the base and narrow coming in. And that's interpreted in the Jewish tradition in two ways. Number one is that the light of the sanctuary goes out into the world uh, and illuminates the world. Uh, it's the light of the sanctuary, but broadened to, to speak to the world. But also he said that when that light is not burning during the day, the light of the world comes in. The light of the world is, comes in widely, but narrowly. In other words, he said to me, as a young student about to go to university, he said, the world out there has a lot you have to take in, but take it in through the lens of the Torah. That which the world teaches you, what you learn from others, which enhances the Torah, is to be accepted graciously. He quoted Maimonides, says, accept the truth from whoever said it. But you accept it because it enlightens the Torah. You just don't say to, 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 to others, you know, I'll accept whatever you say. They have, it has to be directed to the enhancing the Torah. So this is what I've learned from Christians, I've learned especially from Christians, but from Muslims as well, is trying to look through that broad lens at what they have to offer and seeing what of it especially uh, enlightens the Torah that, uh, that has come to me from birth on uh, is the way I've tried to interact with the world. Bringing the light of the Torah in a wider range and accepting the light of those outside of my particular sanctuary uh, more narrowly, but actually what pertains to uh, what we have in, in, in common. Uh, that's how I, I, I've tried to live and, and work, and I'm deeply grateful for the appreciation that has been shown to me by many, many people uh, and uh, as the recipient of this award. Thank you so much. I want to thank everyone this evening for coming. I want to thank uh, especially our, our uh, guest scholar speakers. Let's give them one more round of a thanks, of applause. And I would like to invite each of you to become more involved in the work of the Center for Catholic Jewish Studies. Uh, at the table in the back as you exit, uh, please feel free.